Good morning. And welcome, all of you, to this uh, wonderful conference, our collaborative efforts for change. It's a sunny day in Edmonton. I know there was a little cool bite in the air, but I think that we can bring out our Edmonton hospitality and make this a very warm conference. My name is Kathleen Quinn, and I am uh, honored to be the chair of Edmonton's Sexual Exploitation Working Group that has pulled this conference together. We're respectfully aware that our beautiful city of Edmonton rests on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory. This is the traditional territory of diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, and our beautiful North Saskatchewan River was a gathering place for many and for all of us today. The peoples who have gathered here are of the Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit. We're all here today dedicated to working together as diverse communities and settlers from around the world. Joining us this morning is our elder, Betty Latender, an MLA, Thomas Dang, from our government, and Lyle Brené from the City of Edmonton. Councillor Scott McKean, the City Council Liaison for the Sexual Exploitation Working Group, will join us at noon. I'd like to um, offer a warm welcome to all of our presenters, some of whom have traveled from Vancouver, Montreal, and Calgary at their own expense to be here. Can you please stand our, our uh, presenters from other parts of Canada and be welcomed? Thank you. And we know tomorrow we'll have some Calgarians joining us as well. And I think, uh, is there anyone from Calgary here today as a participant? Yes, great. And another one will join us tomorrow. Wonderful. I would li now like to invite Elder Betty Latender to open with a blessing. Betty is a member of the Papa Chase Band and a direct descendant of... Papa, Sa Papa Stable, I'm sorry, I lost my notes for a moment. Um, Betty is a member of the Council of Elders for the Edmonton Catholic School Board, and she mentors young people at the Ben Calf Road School. She is a woman who uh, has drawn from her life experience and her history and offers uh, those blessings to us today. that brings with it our hopes for healing, compassion, and overcoming the injustices that create sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. I ask that all of us who gather here today, that our hearts and our minds and our spirits might be touched to continue this work of healing. I offer you this tobacco, a sacred medicine of the earth, to, uh, uh, for you to ask you to carry our prayers and our hearts forward. Thank you. Thank you. How do them take ego? Get the wasikuma, kiss the cow me goose here. Ego Mr. Hemi goose yano skaggy skak. How go with chicka matnan, abscess, I miss the moat. Kaki oki o water, Kaki o moat and go to a sick, tabs can kaisi kartik. How Kanyan Nagayasi Monego Kanstuta Goyan. Good morning. It's a beautiful day. I greeted you in my language, the Cree language. This is my language that's with my spirit. 
to say thank you for the beautiful day in this beautiful room and all of you beautiful faces that have come this morning. As I say the prayer this morning, I ask the Creator, however you choose to, to say that in your way you know, but it's from your heart that you will acknowledge that because all of us here are here for a reason. We come from the unknown, that most sacred place. I would ask today, this morning now, if you could stand with me, because one prayer is great. Many praying gives us so much more. I would like you to take the time, a few moments right now, just to focus on you. You are here just for you today. Just as, at this moment, this sacred moment we've been given, right here in our hearts. Just think about that for a second. We go on our busy day, rushing and rushing, rushing to get here, rushing to do everything. And we haven't taken a moment for ourselves to say, I'm okay. I'm well. I can journey on. I'm a beautiful person. I'm loved by many. And for us, that's sometimes hard to, to say to ourselves. I'll pray in my language, decree language, which is so much more meaningful because it's my language, my spirit. Aonuhta seman tuokitsikisko ka enne kauimau kahki o ka mikuusia sitä he emikuja iikumaan eessa uimia vesitus kaukia meistä muukin kuukin kahki o skueo napeva kuista o ka pitti kuetse umasteema o ka mikauian huipena asun kskeitteen egoan meki tiepena maan Tantsikais naga tehtamaan. Sa võime nõuta või ka miu kiis kaatsik. Kahki oo kuuta ka peeni pautsik. Ega mina nägin mõistas ka või pibe hüttu kõetsik. Sa võim naan, tema keem naan. Creator, I ask that you bless us. That you give us the strength to do the work of what is needed and all that's been done not only to women, young girls, but young men, is sexual exploitation. You know, Creator, that sacredness of women, that fire we carry within, and how many times that's been violated. We are the life givers, the givers of life. We're the only human beings that can carry life and help us to help all those yet to come that are here and that we carry this journey on so we can eliminate all that pain and suffering. We have to tell the people we are mothers, we are life givers, we carry that fire within. And help me as I take this tobacco that I've earned so many years ago and this orange flag, I can't say it in my English language, but in my language, it's for healing, it's for prayers. When people are really sick in the hospitals, we take that orange flag and we go put it under their pillows. Many different meanings, Creator. You gave us these teachings, these beautiful teachings, and that gift of womanhood. Therefore, we need to honor our men our warriors, that they become warriors again to teach our youth. All of us together can do that, Creator. Help us as we journey on today and that we can look at each other and say, you are God's creation. You are a blessing to me today. I ask this in our God, our Creator's name. The great divine, some say, that you keep us safe. Just help us to understand one another. Give us the strength, the wisdom, and the courage. 
Hauks de maga nuhta hoi apses. Hai hai. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Betty Latender. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a woman said to me that when she hears the Cree language, she feels comforted by the softness of the language and how it's a healing of the heart. And I, I listened and I heard and felt that softness again this morning. And I thank you. For some of you who are visitors to Edmonton, you may not know that the Papa Chase Band is, uh, is the First Nations who, uh, peoples who gathered in the Edmonton area. And um, Betty is a Cree and Métis woman, and as I mentioned earlier, a direct descendant of Papa Stewo. She grew up in the area north of Lac La Biche, and her parents, her first teachers, lived off the land in a direct and traditional way. She's a champion for children, and I think that's one reason why we're all here. We want to champion our children and our families and our communities to be healthy and healing and welcoming places. Thank you, Betty. Dean Cardinal, who is a member of a mentor at Ben Caffrobe, will be here over the noon hour and will offer some of the medicines for smudging if you would like to partake yourself. That will be in the room uh, just behind us over the lunch hour. <coughs> the Sexual Exploitation Working Group is an Edmonton-based leadership group collaborating to create awareness of sexual exploitation and its multiple causes and its multiple impacts. It's a collaborative of community partners, law enforcement, municipal and provincial government, and REACH Edmonton. We are concerned for those who are vulnerable to sexual exploitation, which includes sex trafficking, whether it's due to age, financial desperation, migration, homelessness, prior childhood abuse or neglect, mental or physical health conditions, intergenerational trauma, the impact of addictions or any other circumstances that contributes to vulnerability to exploitation. It's been 11 years since our first proclamation by our mayor, that was 2005, and we have our 2016 proclamation here um, below if you want to read it. This celebrates over 12 years of work as the sexual exploitation working group in our city. It's the fourth conference that we have organized and hosted. I'd now like to uh, ask the members of the Sexual Exploitation Working Group uh, to stand, as well as any volunteers and staff from those organizations. We're, we're like a, a little community hub and we network out to all the other organizations and communities in the city. So as I call the name of your organization, would you please stand? ACT Alberta, Danielle Monroe, and all the other ACT staff and volunteers. And Danielle was at the table very early, so she's out there somewhere. Um, Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society, Ashley Michelle, and I know I see uh, Patty and others from Bent Arrow, please stand, thank you. Catholic Social Services, this, this is the longest one. Catholic Social Services, Protection of Sexually Exploited Com Children Act, Community Follow-Up Program, Kim. <laughs> CEASE, Center to End All Sexual Exploitation, if all our staff and volunteers and mentors could stand. Thanks. City of Edmonton, Dorian Smith is our lead, but there's several City of Edmonton staff, if you could please stand. Great, thank you. Edmonton and Area Child and Family Services, Protection of Sexually Exploited Children Act, the second longest one. We have Chris Majot and Tony Muvala. Anyone else? Edmonton Police Service Vice Section. We have almost a full table here. If, uh, Dale, Staff Sergeant Dale Johnson, but all of you can stand and be recognized, please. Thank you. Thank you. Reach Edmonton Council for Safe Communities. We have Brittany, Lisa here. 
These are the, these uh, in, incredible women are the reason we all can be here today. They did all the organizing work and the details. The rest of us, we all chipped in where we had our strength and talent, but let me tell you, the details is what got us here and we thank them. Sexual Assault Center, Meta Silva and others, and Shanae and others from uh, SACE, I'll be introducing our counselors later. And the Family Center is a member, but our, our representative is, uh, had a family emergency this morning and couldn't be here. So you may have noticed that members of the working group are wearing orange. We are doing so because orange is a color often associated with freedom movements around the world. It symbolizes change, energy, and the warmth of compassion. Anti-human trafficking organizations around the world have chosen orange as a color, as their color. So today in Edmonton, we stand in solidarity with these initiatives by wearing orange throughout this week of awareness. We are also very pleased that our city lighted up the high-level bridge with orange on Monday night. And uh, we all are committed to working towards shaping a future for our city that is free from sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. You see before you a vase of flowers. These flowers are a symbol of the more than 40 women who are known to be murder victims in the past 35 years in Edmonton. We know there are many more who have died of illness, suicide, the effects of, it, of addiction. We know there are many whose deaths are not officially proclaimed as murders. We think it's very, very important to always remember those who are lost, those whose lives have been stolen, those whose families and communities grieve them. And it is that act of remembering those who have passed that compels us to keep working today so that we can create those communities where children and young people and women and men are, do not become victims of murder or of any other consequence. So I would like to just ask for this moment of silence to remember. You may know people who have been taken from us. You may know families who have lost their loved ones. Thank you. We have to find, keep finding ways to move our collective grief into collective action. I'd like to now welcome Emily Thomas Dang from Edmonton South West. Thank you. <laughs> I have mixed up my notes. <laughs> I apologize for that. Edmonton Southwest, and uh, he has said it's okay if I can remind us all that he is the youngest MLA elected in Alberta to serve in our provincial legislature. And uh, I asked him also if he would carry the weight of responsibility of being a young man in leadership and a young man who will work with other men to uh, help foster healthy masculinity, healthy respect and sexual relations ships and to join in the work to end uh, engaging men and boys to end violence against girls and women. So welcome Thomas. Thanks so much and that was a great introduction. So uh, thank you so much everybody for having me and uh, letting me join you guys here today because it's so important that we as a group can get together and have these discussions and move forward. But really, it's my honor to bring greetings on behalf of Premier Rachel Notley and the government of Alberta um, today because it's an important initiative that everyone in this room is working on. So I'm honored to join you in the territory of Treaty 6 today. Two days ago, we celebrated at the legislature the 100th anniversary of the right for women to vote in Alberta. Um, and I think that's something that we can clap about, absolutely. Um, but we have to also recognize that that was a first step because... That was the 100th anniversary of the right for some women to vote in Alberta. Um, for example, our indigenous, our indigenous sisters didn't get that right until the 1960s. Um, but to celebrate this anniversary, we went and we took a photo on the steps of the legislature, and we took a big group photo to recreate the first day. 
Um, in that photo, we saw Alberta's and the country's first gender balanced cabinet. Um, and right on those, in that gender balanced cabinet, was Minister Stephanie McLean, the country's first standalone minister for the status of women, who was holding her baby boy and, as she was the first woman to give birth while being a sitting MLA. So, in this great day of celebration, it really allowed me to reflect and say, this government is committed to making sure that we understand the issues. We are committed to making sure that we can have these tangible discussions and move forward as a group. So the government was really happy to support the Safer Spaces for Victims of Domestic Violence Act, which passed the legislature last fall. This was another act which is just one of those first steps that allowed us to help move our society forward, which helped us allow so that women who were in possible situations of domestic violence, were fleeing domestic violence, could get out of their leases without penalty. All these are just some examples of what our government, what the Minister of Human Services, and what the Premier have been doing and have made as a commitment to our, to our women and to our men who are, who are in situations which they want to be getting out of. So unfortunately, I personally didn't have much of an experience, well, fortunately, I didn't have much of an experience with um, sexual exploitation, but I, I do want to share a little bit about my experience with sexual assault. Um, I've seen firsthand and I've experienced firsthand many cases of sexual assault. As, as you know, I, I was a university student um, and the youngest elected official. And throughout university, we see over and over again people being assaulted, people being exploited, and people being put in situations in which simply they should not be, in which simply situations which simply nobody should be. And as we reflect on this and as we look forward, we can say, this government needs to make a commitment and has made a commitment to do better. And that's why groups like this are so important because in these discussions, we can foster the ground to, make, to move forward and to make those changes that we need to see. So, once again, I'm especially honored to be bringing greetings today in front of the members of the Sexual Exploitation Working Group and other guests and speakers who traveled from so far and, and from within our province and from outside of our province to bring awareness and to discuss how we can combat these issues in more meaningful ways. It's a truism that everyone must work together to solve these complex problems, but I know that everybody at this table today and everybody that's working on it this, at this conference will be able to come up with those solutions that will be able to make those differences. So once again, on behalf of Premier Notley and the Government of Alberta, thank you everyone so much for everything that you do every day. And it's my sincere hope that one day we can all stand together on the steps of the legislature and we can celebrate the end of sexual exploitation. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, I was on the legislature steps, uh, and I hope to join the celebration of the sexual exploitation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I was just saying that uh, to Thomas that I was on the legislature steps on Monday um, and felt really proud to be part of that incredible crowd of people on those steps uh, marking the beginning of the journey uh, for women. Now we'd like to welcome Lyle Brené, City of Edmonton, and Lyle is the Branch Manager, Community Inclusion and Investment, Citizen Services Department. Thank you, Lyle. So thank you, Kate. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Going from the youngest MLA in the legislature to an old bureaucrat, so lucky you. I want to I wanna bring greetings to you on behalf of uh, Mayor Don Iveson and Edmonton City Council. <clears throat> um, I also really want to acknowledge uh, Elder Betty Latandra. Betty um, has been working with our Indigenous Relations Office for many years as we've uh, worked together on the Bend, Calf Road, Pow Wow, and other indigenous initiatives and Edmonton uh, is becoming a city very committed to reconciliation. Um, our, uh, our mayor constantly reminds us that uh, we are all treaty people and that we are here on the traditional lands of Treaty 6. <clears throat> so I thought I'd spend a bit of time with you this morning talking a bit about some of the things that are going on in the city uh, that I guess I see as being linked to your important work. Um, 
just to give you a flavor, I guess, about what's happening in the city of Edmonton, it sounds a bit like many of you are already from the city. Um, so this may not be new news to you, but for those of you who are a bit, a bit less familiar, hopefully this will be helpful. <clears throat> One of the first things I want to draw your attention to is our End Poverty Edmonton initiative. And this is a, a very big uh, community building, uh, community movement that's growing in our city, um, led by our mayor, Bishop Jane Alexander. Process began a couple of years ago. It's involved thousands of Edmontonians, a task force of 22, uh, seven working committees, uh, two expert roundtables, one on information and research, one representing Aboriginal community interests, who've uh, come together to put a strategy to help Edmonton eliminate poverty within a generation. Very aspirational goal, but one that uh, in a province as prosperous as ours, even though oil's a bit low in terms of value, we think is achievable. <clears throat> Strategy is uh, built on a, on a foundation of best practice research, uh, some of which has occurred in the city. Uh, Families First Initiative um, <coughs> developed uh, a sort of a series of supports for families trying to work themselves out of poverty. And from those case notes, six game-changing um, ideas came out to help inform some of the work. Uh, game changes to help people get out of poverty, and poverty is so linked to vulnerable people experiencing exploitation of many types. So those game changers include uh, eliminating racism, um, providing affordable, accessible housing, uh, affordable, accessible transit, affordable, accessible, and quality childcare. Um, the whole notion of trying to provide additional support for people uh, to get at mental health supports, and finally, the whole notion of livable incomes. <clears throat> and those game changers help to inform um, the hundreds and hundreds of actions built on about 90 recommendations that we're trying to sort of weed down to uh, priorities for the next 10 years. So the strategy was approved by council in December, and it'll go forward in May of this year with an implementation roadmap that we're pretty excited about. <clears throat> it's gonna require a lot of partnership with community, partnership with business, partnership with other orders of government, and all of us sort of pulling oars in the same direction to help eliminate poverty. Another initiative is uh, one that's led by councillors Esslinger and uh, McKean, and Scott McKean will be here at, I think, noon today to bring greetings from the city as well. And that's on gender-based violence prevention. And that initiative is beginning to really get stronger and, and build some momentum. A number of pieces of work have already occurred, <clears throat> best practices research, as well as trying to create better awareness across the city as a whole about the importance of dealing with gender-based violence. A recent initiative that we've uh, undertaken in collaboration with the province, the uh, Alberta Status of Women, is uh, the UN Safe Cities, Safe Public Spaces uh, program. It's an application that our mayor will make uh, along with the Minister of the Status of Women on behalf of Edmonton and the province to try to build a safer city for women and girls, and both as it relates to public spaces and um, public safety. Uh, our Youth Council produced a very exciting video, a documentary on youth homelessness. Uh, as you probably are already aware, a number of um, there's a very high incidence of sexual exploitation and vulnerability in youth living on the street. And that one hour hard hitting documentary produced by our youth council um, really, I think, brought home the importance of focusing on that sector uh, and that population as we go forward. There's another council initiative uh, that focuses on urban isolation mental health. Uh, Scott McKean is the champion of that one as well. Uh, building strategies around uh, providing additional support and awareness of the importance of mental health. It includes a suicide prevention framework and a number of other initiatives. Staff have been involved with um, ACT and reducing uh, human trafficking. And um, although these initiatives are all fairly recent, many of our staff have been involved in work for a number of years. So I just want to uh, just quickly draw your attention to some of those things. I do want to acknowledge um, 
City Council's deep appreciation for the work that you do. It's not easy work. Uh, they recognize that. Um, they're also a council that I think is really, uh, has a strong sense of social justice, wants to do well by not the average Edmontonian, but for all Edmontonians. So it's a pretty exciting time for our staff to be working in the city right now, given the support that we get from our own politicians, as well as those from the two other orders of government. So we wish you well for the next couple of days. Hope your conversations are deep and meaningful. And uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of the city for your work. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lyle. It is a good time uh, to be um, in working and living in Edmonton and seeing so many things come together that have been rooted in work over the last 30 years, and it's, it's a privilege to see, see it all coming together and weaving together. We're doing pretty good on our time. I now have a few housekeeping details. So first of all, we decided to be modern and save money and not produce a conference booklet. It is a, was sent to you uh, by um, Link um, from Brittany. So you can look at it online. There is one conference um, outline on each table. I've just noticed that Estefania is, is here and I would like to uh, welcome you, another one of our uh, MLAs. Thanks. Would you like to say a moment? Yeah. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm uh, extremely happy to be here with you today. I'm the MLA for Strathcona Sherwood Park. I was recently elected, and uh, as Thomas Dang uh, was saying, he's, he's the youngest one. Um, I was actually really wanting to be here beforehand, but there was some community events that I, I, that I needed to be at. So thank you, Thomas, for, for kind of stepping up to the plate. But I'm extremely passionate to be here, and uh, this is something that I've worked on you know, for, for many years that, uh, and what I see around whenever I go to, you know, those social work aspects or uh, the work that you're doing is inspiration and hope that uh, that you should know is is reflected in your provincial government. You know, from anything like uh, the personal stories being shared in the legislature, a good example being Maria Fitzpatrick's story. Um, that it's being acknowledged as not just an issue that is talked about silently, but it's something that we need to, to raise awareness as, a, as something that we can't accomplish and the work that you do, that you do has to be mirrored in, in our provincial landscape as well and mirrored in the communities and uh, which is why I just wanted to get up here and, and just say, you know what, you have a partner in us, our provincial government is absolutely committed into improving the status of women into improving uh, circumstances and situations for people that are continuously cycling into the, the, the circumstances of sexual exploitation, whether it be it because of their, their income levels, because of the community that they were born into. And you know what, it's just not, not an acceptable circumstance that we need to continue and there's, there's things that we can do to prevent it. And uh, we're working hard to do that. So, you know, we, we elected the first uh, gender balance cabinet and, uh, you know, gender balance uh, representatives in the NDs and we started the status of women and our minister were the first one to have a, a baby in the legislature. It reflects, you know, a change. You know, recently we ce celebrated 100 years of women's vote. Um, but that change doesn't reflect everybody at that point, right? And so we have progress and there's so much more to go. And the work that you do absolutely in the next few days, it's, it's absolutely incredible. Know that you have a partner in us and we're interested in hearing what you have to say. My background is in social work and uh, early education. Um, and uh, now I'm a politician. So. Here we are, and uh, I, I really look forward to hearing what the, of the conversations that come out of this, and uh, know that uh, if if that requires policy change, we're interested in hearing that as well. So thank you very much uh, for for letting me take the mic. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Estefania. Well, you heard the invitation and the challenge, so if there's policy work and ideas that we have, let's bring them forward. 
Those of you who are social workers can apply for credits. Uh, you'll just have to submit the paperwork to the College of uh, Social Workers. Um, I would also like to just point out that we, we do have a quiet room downstairs and if, if ever any of the conversation is too heavy or you just want a space apart, uh, you can find that room downstairs easily. There's signs. We also have two counselors each day with us from the Sexual Assault Center. And again, if there's anything that you would just like to talk about, you just have to find them. I'm going to ask them now to stand Janelle and Hala. And they have, they have the orange uh, tag on. And if there's any other questions that you have, find a person with an orange tag and we will do our best to uh, help. One thing that uh, we also have to talk about at conferences now is uh, cell phones, uh, to please turn on to silent, and also to please not record anything uh, that our speakers are sharing. With respect to tweeting, we know again that's a very positive uh, way to get messages out and to, to let people know what exciting things are happening. So we just ask you to tweet respectfully, and if any of our speakers uh, don't want anything that they're speaking to be tweeted, I'm going to invite the speakers to say that at the beginning of their talk. And another way around it is to not put a name to it, not to say Kathleen Quinn said da da da, but to say, you know, at the Sioux conference I learned. So if we can uh, use our social media respectfully, that would be, that would be great. I will be coming back at the uh, end of our keynote speaker um, to introduce the panel, and then I'll have a few more directions around our lunchtime uh, and then our, our afternoon workshops. But at this moment, I would like to invite Karen Bruno to come forward. Karen was born in Moskotis, which is south of Edmonton. I, I first uh, got to know Karen through some of her work with, as a frontline worker with Boyle Street Community Services, and she has worked in a number of frontline positions and I think brings a wealth of personal and um, work experience to our time today. She's been recognized in our community as an Aboriginal role model. And she was uh, recognized by the Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women with the Esquayo Awards. So um, she, uh, another exciting thing that we have happening in our city is the uh, Miskwichi History Series. And she, and I think Larissa is here from the city, Larissa, and maybe some others are involved in helping those of us who don't know the history of our uh, land in Edmonton to learn that history. I think that's really an important thing. So I'd like to welcome Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everybody. I've got a bit of a cold, so I'll be hacking every once in a while. I'll try to control it, but it's a tickle, so. Um, I'd like to thank Betty for her prayers and her wise words. Those are words that we need to really incorporate and understand what that means. Sometimes when our elders speak, we don't truly hear what they're saying. Um, it, we don't truly understand and make that connection to those words and the importance of those words. And that's just not for just our people, it's for all peoples. We're all in this together. We're all humans, so we all have to be aware of what our uh, respected elders have to say. Um, and yes, I'm originally from Muskwichi, also known as uh, formerly Hobima, and, uh, but I moved out here at a very young age. Uh, my mom was um, a survivor of Indian Residential School and uh, uh, was uh, very familiar with her language, but had insisted that we move into the city and uh, that I become educated and try and live uh, a better life. And uh, that was a journey of its own for sure with a single mother who was very visibly Aboriginal and uh, was in a time when just women in general were struggling educationally and for work. Um, I want to say my Indian name because I did get my Indian name uh, I did go to Sundance and 
uh, for four years, and I did receive an Indian name, but sometimes I get embarrassed because I don't speak my language, even though my mom was fluent. Uh, I don't speak my language, so I have a hard time sometimes saying it. I've spelt it a million times, and people that speak our language, I say, say it again, say it again, you know, kind of thing, and I just don't have the dialect. I don't have the tongue for my language. I've taken classes. I've done everything I can, but unfortunately, uh, you know, my brain has learned the English language, and that I can't even do well either. So, you know, I'm, I'm really messed up in that way of of learning and um, but it is peace of squale okay and that's Sun woman <coughs> and um, I was told that um, when I received that uh, after doing four years when I received that um, that name uh, it was explained to me that it was because um, the Sun is a source of energy and for years of working in the inner city and even before that and as a young girl um, I always gave out my energy and always sort of done what I could to help or support or even to my own det detrimental health kind of thing I've always done that and so <clears throat> that was the name I was given like I said, I originally come from the Hobima area, and my mom moved into the city, and, um, you know, we experienced a lot of homelessness, and uh, uh, every year we moved, and for me, as a young girl, um, I witnessed a lot of the deterioration that uh, my mom had to go through in regards to trying to find peace with herself and trying to... Um, blend in and assimilate and uh, you know she'd always tell me as a young girl even why are you always trying to be Indian and uh, I quite didn't quite understand it was something that I knew I was but uh, it even when we went to go visit in the reserve I was made to stand right beside her I couldn't go play with my cousins she'd tell me not to run around and uh, not to go with them anywhere but after about maybe eight beers she wasn't focusing on me and I got to run around <laughs> um, so you know it's uh, it was sad to see my mom struggle uh, as a woman and I was with her for that journey and uh, because of our constant moving um, it was something that uh, really took a toe on me as a young girl I learned a lot of great skills to survive but I also learned a lot of things like anger and resentment and racism. And uh, also, uh, because we moved every year, I never got to stay in a school long enough. And so by the time I was 24, I could maybe read a, you know, to about a grade four level. And uh, although I did graduate, um, you know, that was part of my skill. I had learned to really figure out how to manipulate things to survive. <coughs> um, by the time I was probably about 14, um, I had really formed my own addiction issues. Uh, so I was 14, I was angry, I was uh, resentful, and I was violent. And uh, I had really uh, exposed that proudly to the world. I really didn't have nothing to lose. And, uh, you know, I ended up, um, because of my mom's constant relationships, she learned how to survive too. And it was constantly at the goodwill of uh, men. And so I had a new daddy all the time. And we, we went through the role and my mom would say, okay, this is your dad. And I'd, okay, daddy, you know, kind of thing. And so we just, I just learned that whole way of life. And, um, uh, you know, that in itself was a form of sexual exploitation for sure. But, uh, you know, a lot of our family members were involved in that. And, uh, you know, uh, some of my cousins who uh, 
I was very close to who were involved with uh, children's services and foster care, when they'd run, I'd go hang out with them. And we'd end up in the downtown core. And uh, we would, you know, run around and do what we needed to do to survive. And uh, it became a, a way of life. And I don't think anybody really wakes up one day and thinks, I'm going to be an addict. <coughs> <coughs> and um, I'm going to do things that I need to do to survive. Um, and as you get involved in that way of life, and I'm sure, you know, I'm not talking, this isn't strange to a lot of people, but for some people it might be, um, you wake up and you think about how you're going to survive for the day and how you're going to, you know, uh, fulfill your needs for the day, whether it be addictions or a uh, source of security or that kind of thing. So you become quite vulnerable as a woman on the street, but at the same time you become quite numb and you do those kind of things you need to do to become quite numb. So that was sort of my life for a while. And then I became pregnant. And uh, with my first child. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. And uh, who's here today, Jordan. And um, um, I tried for the first bit with him. Um, you know, I tried to have a healthy pregnancy, although to me, healthy was like to stay off the harder stuff and, and uh, not to do the heavier stuff. And, you know, um, the concept of being around stress, well, that wasn't even a concept. Uh, you know, so I had a very stressful sort of pregnancy, you know, trying to stay stable and avoid abuse and that kind of thing. But, and the first year was good. But after that, after that first year, of trying to make sense of it all and trying not to be something that I didn't know how to not be um, was difficult. To watch other people have, when I was a kid and I sat at bus stops, I sat at bus stops a lot. And I still do the same thing while people watch her. And I sat at bus stops, and I'd watch these clean, smelling, graceful looking, uh, rich looking, non-native people. And I think, they're going to they're gonna take me, and they're going to get me out of here. And, and, and they're going to rescue me, you know, kind of thing. And that was, you know, when that didn't happen, that's where the resentment got brought in. And <coughs> and the anger and the the feeling of not worthiness, and so that's where that whole kind of trauma perpetuated, and um, along with all the other stuff. And so when I became a mother, I knew I needed to be something else, but I really didn't have the role models or the idea of what that looked like. I knew there was something, but I didn't know what that really looked like, other than what I had seen on TV. My Aboriginal role model was Cher, and, uh, and still is, <laughs> although I found out she's not Aboriginal, which was totally devastating. <laughs> um, but Half Breed, the, word, the song Half Breed, if you've never heard it, you got to like, hear it, was just, to me, in the 70s, had to have been like, really groundbreaking if she was really Aboriginal. Anyways, um, but so, anyways, I'll stay in denial of that fact. But, um, so, you know, that's, that's sort of, I wanted to reach that. But when I realized I couldn't, and services looked very differently back then, that was 30 years ago. And I couldn't reach that and I didn't know how, and it wasn't meant for me. And. I honestly believed women deserved a good licking. I had a mindset that was very different. <coughs> so, um, it was something of a dream, and it was way over there. And, uh, and unfortunately, it got to me, and I started drinking and using again. And my mom stepped in, and she took my son for a couple of years. And uh, my first thought when she took my son was, good, you know, he'll be safe and good because now I can really use hard. 
and I can do what I need to do and finish this journey. I didn't expect to live long. It's funny because none of us, when we grow up in that atmosphere, if you talk to a lot of youth, a lot of people that come from that journey, they don't think they're gonna live past 30. So they don't plan. We don't plan. We don't, we don't protect ourselves uh, physically. We do whatever we can to basically commit a long suicide. We, you know, do whatever drug there is. We get into fights. Doesn't matter if the guy's six feet tall. We, you know, get into that car that we got to have a gut feeling we shouldn't. Uh, you know, you just do things that you just think you're not necessarily invincible from, but who gives a shit, really? And um, so time goes on, and geez, you know, the guilt of being a mother really got to me. He was getting to be about three. He's starting to potty train. And um, you know, I knew he was going to be going to school soon. And so I decided I got to start this journey, whatever it is. And I reached out for help. And um, slowly but surely, uh, I got there. And uh, I remember I took a program. And uh, the program was, uh, <coughs> For some of us old schoolers, you'll remember this. It was called Native Pre-Employment Program. And um, I remember uh, making a goal sheet, which I never had heard of goals before. What is your you know, five-year plan? OK. And so my first goal was to get up before 9. That would be nice. And my second goal was to be able to read and write. And my third goal was to be able to parent. And these were all basic things, you know. And uh, I learned the cycle of abuse. That was like a ah, moment for me. The cycle of abuse. You mean that I'm not the only, this isn't the way it's supposed to be? What? You mean I'm carrying 500 generations of trauma? What? You know, it, it ignited something in me. That rebellious anger crap that I had in me was ignited. And I thought, why, why is this, a, why is this um, a secret? Why don't our people know about this? Why, why isn't this shared? Um, you know how many people we could save with this knowledge? You know how many people we could you know, have them come to their full potential with this kind of knowledge. And so it just became sort of my life journey uh, to get educated and to understand. And um, I did go to college, it was a struggle. I had by then three children. I was the oldest one. Um, I was already in my late 20s. <coughs> I was um, the only Aboriginal one in my class. I was still in program mode, so when we went to school and I had to uh, answer questions, I'd answer it like I was talking to a social worker. And I'd give them this long explanation as to why, you know, things were the way they were. And so the teacher set me aside and said, you know, this isn't life skills. Uh, you know, you don't have to explain. You know, there is a thing called privacy. But we're conditioned that way. We're conditioned to explain everything. We want a bus ticket, you're going to get a lifelong story as to why I need that bus ticket. <laughs> you know, uh, you know it's, it's, it's just the way we're programmed. We're programmed since we're young to explain ourselves. And <coughs> um, I managed to pass. Uh, even though I was in a, uh, a not very good situation at home, I still managed to pass. Um, even though I was recently sober, I managed to pass. And even though um, I was basically a single mom uh, with three very wound up kids that got kicked out of every daycare in the damn city, I managed to pass. Um, and I barely passed. And I remember a student goes, oh, 
I got 97%. What did you get? And I got, oh, I got 67%. And I get the same damn diploma you do. Yay! <laughs> you know, so. I, uh, I uh, always got by life by the skin of my teeth. Everything's been a fight. Uh, I've had to fight for everything. I've had to fight for housing. I've had to fight for respect. Um, I've had to fight to parent my children the way I wanted to parent them. I've had to fight for pretty much everything. And uh, it gets ingrained in you. You know, I'm at the age now where I should relax. I've even moved out of the city, and I should relax. But I have this fight in me that I don't know what to do with, and people are telling me, elders are telling me, relax now. You no longer have to be that sun. You need to be like the moon, where you're just orbiting around everybody, and you're just kind of watching and, and letting the people that you shared your energy with see what they become. Let them be now, you know, kind of thing. It's hard because I have this fight, and it's, I have this fight within myself, even, um, you know. And, and, and I was just talking to somebody yesterday, and she said she wanted to do some Reiki stuff on me. And I was like, yeah, you know, kind of thing. And then she goes, because you're carrying all this stuff right here. And she goes, <coughs> <coughs> and you need to release it. You have breathing problems and you have you know kind of thing and I'm like yeah I do but I want to keep it for a while <laughs> and she goes why and I said because it's mine it's what I own I really don't know how to identify myself as anything else um, I think that anybody who knows me and I have a few people in the room that really know me know that I've I'm a fighter if there's a fight to be had I'm there Maybe not physically anymore, but I'm there. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, is it my place anymore? I don't know. These are the kind of things that, as time goes by, do I want to release my trauma? I think I should. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm showing some health issues from the trauma that I've had. I'm, I'm you know, showing the stress. Um, people keep saying, you got to let it go but it's mine. You know, I don't know. Will that change me? You know, will that, will that make me a softer, kinder, less fight kind of person? Will I, will, I, will I still have that kind of passion that I had for stuff? I don't know. So that's where I'm at and trying to deal with that kind of stuff right now. And, uh, you know, when I really watch other women and um, sort of what they go through and their lifelong journeys and I realize that our role as Aboriginal women is a lot of responsibility. Traditionally, you know, we, we were the fire keepers. We were the life givers and that was honored and respected. And, you know, I was thinking about Treaty 6 and I had heard from Sylvia McAdam uh, she's the um, she's the lady who uh, developed the idol no more, and I had the um, through Miskachi Histories I had the uh, blessings of hearing her speak, and um, she was talking about our role as Aboriginal women <coughs> and how. Um, by, by, the time, by the time the Indian agents and the government came to develop Treaty 6, um, the women had watched what had happened with all the other treaties. And so they had learned um, a little bit more to be a little bit more prepared. And so when the men went up and talked with and negotiated the treaties, they kept taking breaks and they kept leaving. And the Indian agents and the government was wondering what, you know, what was going on, that they kept taking these breaks. And what was happening is that they were going back to the women, and they were telling the women what was being requested. And the women would give them direction. 
and they would go back and they would give that direction. And, you know, um, it was uh, enlightening to me that way. Um, and it was also uh, a way of me realizing that I have a responsibility, which I already knew, but I didn't know why I felt that way. I also wanted to mention, like, my name is Karen Bruno, but I was adopted. Uh, my mom was adopted in the Indian way. And uh, so really, I'm a buffalo and uh, from Hobima. And um, when I met that family, the women in that family, I realized, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I know where that, this personality came from, because the other women in my family are not, they're very quiet and meek, and I'm the bigger, and I mean bigger, uh, of the bunch, and my cousins are all tall and skinny and model-like, and there's me, and, you know, and it just made sense, all of a sudden I fit. So, <coughs> for me, I'm 51, and I'm still always learning. And I do carry that trauma. And I do deal with that trauma every day. I have triggers all the time. I, I, you know, I still need ceremony to deal with stuff. I still need the Western way of dealing with stuff. I still see a psychologist. I still fight for that peace and that mellowness. And... Part of it is because I don't want to let it go yet, because that's my identity. That's how I identified myself. <coughs> <coughs> there are things that we, as Aboriginal people, need to be aware of. We need to be aware of our treaties. A lot of people don't know. And those treaties weren't meant for just Aboriginal people. They were meant for all of us. Uh, they were written to protect all of us. And the Indian Act. The Indian Act was developed around the same time Treaty 6 was developed, in uh, 1876, around there, around the same time. And if anybody's had an opportunity to read that Indian Act that hasn't changed a lot, um, the section, oh, I can't say that word, section, that's where my Indianness comes out, section, six. Anyways. <laughs> Just like social worker. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Section, see, I can't say it. Section six. I've got to say it in my white girl voice. Hello. No, I'm just kidding. Um, sex, ugh. you know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> there's certain words I just can't say. Anyways, um, that section uh, sort of defines a woman's role, Aboriginal woman's role. And in a non sort of in sort of a political way, it really discriminates against Aboriginal women. And it really sets a tone about how Aboriginal women were viewed and um, how, how um, they could really break down a culture. Now, if you ever heard about genocide, the best way to do it is to break down family and to break down culture. And they really knew that the women were the ones who held the power. So they knew to break down that. And they knew to attack the women. And they knew that without the women, they didn't have the strength, the men didn't have the strength to move forward. And it was very, I'm gonna mess this up, but patriarchal, male dominating. And you can see that in some of the laws that they um, invented over the years, <coughs> like Bill C-31. Even though they have amended some of that stuff, it's still there. And I honestly believe, in my heart of hearts, that that set a tone. And I did some research with a coworker of mine about a year ago, a year and a half ago. And um, we went to the archives at the Princess uh, Armory thing. And um, we were reading some of the actual 
materials of this area that where some of the chiefs were writing letters to um, some of the Indian agents and the governments to protect their women, that their women were getting raped and murdered. So the fact of murdered and missing women have been happening a long time. And it's legislation, when you talk about changing policy, where'd she go? Uh, when we talk about, oh there you are, when we talk about changing policy, we really need to look at that Indian Act and how it defines women and change that. The other thing that a lot of people aren't aware is that we as Aboriginal people are not free people. We live in a colonized state. It's true. Trust me. And I'll tell you why, because I wrote it down. It's part of the research I did. Um, so there's a thing called Doctorate of Discovery. So when um, the land was discovered, they did a thing that, that was very symbolic for Christianity. And they jumped out of the boat, they took their sword cross, and they stabbed it into the land. And they did a blessing. And then in that blessing, on behalf of the crown, it says, anything that's on this land, uh, anything that's uh, from this land now belongs to us. And that's the doctorate of discovery that became a law. And this I also learned from Sylvia McAdam, who also is a master's, is it master's or doctorate of law? It's one of those two. Anyways, <coughs> so she knows her legal terms. <coughs> and so we come from a colonized state and we're not free people because we are wards of that state. As Aboriginal people, as treaty people, and now that they've changed it so that we're all, uh, whether you're non-status or Métis, what, we, what that means, we're not sure, but now that we sort of fit on all that category, I'm assuming we're all now wards of that state. And as wards of that state, we're not allowed to own businesses. We don't own our homes. We're not allowed to have real estate or businesses on our crown land. And even in death, if it's not in the best interest of government, uh, they can have a say in how we die to how we're buried, and they have. So even in our um, death, there's control there. <coughs> but do I want to end on that note? No. Because if I did, if I carried on with that anger, if I carried on with that feeling of defeat, if I carried on with that feeling of not being responsible, what's my part, then I guarantee Edmonton would be a different place. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I guarantee that there would have been laws made around me. I don't know, huh? <sighs> By the way, the education that I decided to get into was uh, corrections. I didn't want to be a social worker. Um, I didn't want to become one of those. <coughs> so I took corrections. And I did work um, in some of the local prisons. And um, trust me, being an Aboriginal woman in an environment back then was they were considered guards, not correctional officers. There was still lots of old school. It was very, 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 very difficult. I wasn't allowed to sit with them for lunch. I had to go sit with the image, which was fine with me because I knew half of them. <laughs> I was like a reunion. <laughs> and then the other part of that was that I had quickly learned that it was a real poor choice in career because half of the inmates I either was related to or I dated, so yeah, that was just bad. <laughs> but no, I'm just joking. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. I'm not, honey, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm just joking. 
Love you. Anyways, <laughs> I usually give this speech when he's not around. Huh? I've got to rethink. Anyways, so um, <coughs> I did get to work at um, Stan Daniels, and that's where I got that sense of community. And uh, I got the idea of what it's like to work within community and to work within culture. Um, from there, uh, I did move on to Boyle Street and uh, did work there for 20 years. It was my town, it was my reserve, it's my community. Inner city will always be my community. It's my place where I feel most connected to. Um, it's my home. And yeah, it's just where I, it's what I know. So I've always been able to walk this line, a bridge of connecting the white world and the non-native world, or the native world together. I know the importance of allies. I have some allies in this room. I've worked with some great, great non-Aboriginal people who, when we get together, it's not about me being Aboriginal and them being non-native. It's about us being in together. And it's about us doing for the greater good it's about us doing what's important in the best interest of our people, whoever that may be. When that happens, there is a, there is a, there is a, a synergy that cannot be broken. When you collaborate and everybody's got the best interest of the people and egos aren't involved, it's amazing the work that can get done. I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it so many times. I've seen programs that are just bang on. When we involve our community, when we listen to our community, when we put our egos aside and we become community, it's amazing. You know, if we sit there and really hear what's being said, just like I said with our elders, our, here listening to our youth, listening to our women on the street, listening to our men. You know, it's, it's, you really do get the message if you're listening. It's said time and time again what they need. And so <coughs> <coughs> collaborating just doesn't mean as professionals. It also means listening to our people, what they say they really need. You know, elders say that we're born with four things, our spiritual, our mental, our physical, and our emotional. And that we as Aboriginal people, and we as people, need to take back our power. We need to take back that source of energy. We need to take back the sense of humanity. You know, there is a crisis out there and I'm not just saying that, just to say that. There is a crisis out there. The world has changed. The, the need for more help and more understanding has increased. The world shifted. We're all off our axles a little bit. Not just me anymore. We're all there. So, you know, <coughs> so what does that really mean, taking back our power? What that really means is that there needs to be a willingness. There needs to be a knowing. There needs to be a belief. You have to believe it. That first time I tried to sober up, I didn't believe it. I just didn't believe it. It doesn't happen to me. The second time, I needed to believe it. You know, and I still need to believe it. There isn't many days that don't go by where I got to remind myself why I'm here. I miss drinking. I miss my addictions. I miss my street life. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to anybody about how much I miss that. There was a sense of freedom that no one will ever understand. There's a, the lack of responsibility, the lack of not caring. 
you know, it's, 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 it's a different feeling. It's a euphoria that no one can ever explain. But I find that in other things now. I find that when I look at my grandson. I find that when I go to ceremony, I find that at our gatherings, powwows, ground dances, I find that in my relationship. I find that other places now, and you have to look for it, and you have to be a part of it, and you have to be present. And so you need to find that kind of stuff. For the people who haven't been ever told that, I'm telling you now. So you don't have excuses. We make excuses for us to go forward out of fear. Fear is very debil debilitating. I know. I live in it every day. But I, I was, had a fight or flight response this morning. I wanted to leave. I don't know why I keep telling my husband, why do I agree to do these kind of things? Why? And he says, oh, I don't know. Good response. He's great that way. <laughs> he just sort of puts his head down and goes, I don't know. <laughs> you know, and because um, it's that sense of responsibility that keeps bringing me back. Don't listen to those message, messages in the media. Don't participate in lateral violence amongst each other. Support each other. That's a colonized act that we've learned amongst, e amongst each other. When one of us is starting to make it, we start pulling others down. It's a very manipulative style that we've learned. And the most important thing is always remember that we're in this journey together. When you're on your deathbed, and I've sat beside many people, trust me, many people who were on their deathbeds, even witnessing them pass, <coughs> or even finding them. <coughs> Those people that were, and I'll tell you one of them, Mary Burley, who was a woman who worked at Boyle Street for many years. And again, all the old school people would know her. There's a park named after her. And she got lung cancer. And I was new in the field. And so I'd take her to her chemo, and I was asking her, you know, what kind of advice? She came from the States. And uh, she was a woman who had been experienced lots of oppression. Uh, she was a black woman from the States. And she had brought her family up here. And uh, I asked her what was some of the most important things. And she said, at the end of the day, it's family, and it's how we connect as human beings. And I've always kept that really close. And so I try to be respectful. I try my best to be my best. I try and walk in prayer. But sometimes that fight in me comes out. And... Um, you know, that's when I rely on my collaborations and the partnerships that I've developed over the years and uh, that have become friendships. Because you can't not help um, becoming long-term friends with people who have dedicated their lives to these kind of practices. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for listening. Uh, it was an honor to be asked to come today. And uh, I'd like to thank the coordinators and the organizers for the great job that they're doing. It's important work. And uh, Kate, for asking me to be a part of this. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your conference. And I hope you guys listen. And uh, I hope you guys participate with your ears and your eyes and your heart. Thank you.
Jesus. Thank you. Well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> but thank you. We have a few, uh, a few moments. If uh, someone would like to ask a question, maybe you could direct it to Dorian, if you could stand up. Uh, if you have a question and maybe just jot it down, Dorian will come and, and pick it up. Um, I wanted to say thank you on behalf of all of us. I think you, you, you took us on our journey. Uh, you took us to some places of pain and tears. You invited us to laugh with you, which also, that's a gift itself that helps us walk through difficult times or uh, to hear difficult things. So thank you for that. And thank you for your years of um, walking in this world and trying to make, make sense of the journey and bring healing for yourself and your family and, and all of us. And if, um, I don't know if there's any questions, uh, I had one. So my question was, um, you gave us a challenge, which was to listen deeply to what people are saying they need. And I wondered if you had anything to offer from what some of the, the young people are saying they need uh, from the community in Edmonton. Um, in my early career, I worked a lot with uh, gang members and, um, and what I would call generational street youth. <coughs> I think one of the biggest things that they said that they needed, of course, with that population, they don't come right out and say, I need, um, but with me listening to them, um, was stability. Uh, as a professional, they needed me to have those good, solid boundaries, to be consistent, to follow through. And um, they needed that stability because in their chaotic lives, sometimes you're the only stable thing they have. And that gives us a, a sense of safety and security. The other thing that they didn't say they needed, but I thought it was important, was as much education and knowledge that I could share. So every time I went to a workshop or every time I had an opportunity, I would take them with me uh, to workshops. Um, and they became more cognitively, cognitively aware, just like I did when I realized that cycle of abuse term. And uh, they started participating. So they started being speakers, and they started being involved. And that helped that sense of healing and change and understanding. So that would be, that would be my answer to that. Thank you. Any other questions or, or reflections from your own experience? Well, you have a journey. You don't know whether you'll keep being the sun or the moon, where you are in your uh, cycle around the, the earth. But I think um, you know that everyone in this room is an ally and with you. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.